I had a subscriber comment on one of my community polls and ask me to, under, to explain thermals and wind currents better. They said they're from Florida and it's really flat down there. And when they come up to Illinois in the hilly areas, the thermals just beat the crap out of them. So I'm going to explain it to the best of my ability. I've spent probably the last three years pretty heavily studying this and trying to understand it better. I feel like I've got some information I can pass on. So let's start with what thermals are. At the very basis, thermals are the heating and cooling of air currents that cause your scent to fall or rise. So in a hill scenario like that, uh, we'll say you're up here, in that tree, your thermals will either fall or they will rise. There is a very small time window I found where they actually rise. For example, we'll say shooting light is 630. I've found that thermals will rise from 620 to 7 at the latest. After that, thermals start to fall down your hills, down in your valleys, down towards water. Uh, it's that first early morning heat up that causes those thermals to rise, but it doesn't last very long. Now this can be advantageous if you're targeting a specific deer and you know that at 6 32 every morning he gets up out of his bed and he makes his way down the hill that allows you to climb this hill get up here get the thermals above his head no matter where he's going and get a shot at him but that's about the only only situation where i found uh, the use of thermals or trying to catch a thermal rise to be advantageous it seems like anytime after this your thermals start to drop i've had a few situations where they kind of hang and float but that doesn't last very long before they're dropping again now, basically anytime after this, throughout the rest of the day, your thermals are going to drop. And when they really start to drop heavily is in your evenings, uh, we'll say an hour before the end of shooting to the end of shooting and past that. And I tend to like thermals dropping better. To me, it's a lot more uh, manageable. It's also a lot more predictable. Now that we've covered what thermals are and kind of the basis of how they work, let's step into the concept of the way they flow. So the best way I've seen this explained and what made the most sense to me is you have to look at thermals the way you look at water flowing. So if you were sitting in your tree stand and we'll say you had just a massive bucket of water and you could dump it and watch the water go down the hillsides, that's the way your thermals are gonna flow. So we'll say you got two hilltops, and you've got this valley that snakes down to a river bottom down here. Your thermals are going to follow that valley like it's a river. So if you're sitting up here in the evening and you're expecting deer to come up over the top of the hill, your thermals are gonna flow down this way and you should be able to get a shot at that. However, if you're expecting the deer to come from down here or cross this at any point, they're going to get your scent long before you could ever potentially have a shot at them. So you have to be cognizant of those thermals. Matter of fact, I look at thermals and the terrain I'm hunting way before I look at wind direction because I've actually had many scenarios where thermals supersede wind direction. And this is especially true in a light wind. It seems like a little heavier winds obviously you can push your scent a little better. But in light wind scenarios, sub five miles an hour we'll say, uh, thermals will always in my experience, supersede that wind direction. Let me give you an example. So last year I set up on a hillside and it worked like this. It was a very steep hillside and down here at the bottom, there was a trail that deer were just going all through all crazy in every different direction, really beat up. I was very hyped on the spot. So I got about mm, 40 yards up the hill, climbed up a tree and I thought, great, I'm 10 foot up in this tree and I'm still you know, 30 feet above where they're going to see me. So I'm way above their sight line. This was an evening spot. The problem is I didn't take thermals into account. Now, when I climbed up in the tree, it was probably a 15 to 20 mile an hour wind. So a good strong wind. And it was actually blowing my scent kind of across the hill in this direction and into a valley that swept it away from where I expect the deer to be walking. So early setup, it was a great setup. My wind was blowing down here and then it was following this valley down and I was good. The problem is my wind died down to all of about three miles an hour in the evening. And as I was dropping my wind checker, I was watching my scent float right down that hill, right down to where I expected all those deer to walk. And the way it was working is when it hit that valley, it was dispersing in all the different directions. 
that killed that area completely and turned what I thought would be a great spot into a terrible spot. And that switch happened in a 10 minute span. Matter of fact, I won't forget, I dropped, I dropped one of my wind checkers. I looked at the, my phone, it was 417. About five minutes later, I dropped another wind checker and it was doing that. So in a five minute span, my wind went from great to terrible, just that quick. And it's all because of thermals. So, that's how thermals can burn you. Let's talk about how you can use them to your advantage. And this is something I do quite a bit as well. I, because I'm in Illinois, I tend to hunt a lot of creek bottoms. Uh, and one advantage of thermals and water is that in the evenings especially, thermals are pulled towards the water. So we'll say you have a pond there and a tree right here on the edge of the pond. I have climbed up in this tree before expecting deer to come from down here and up here 20 yards away. And in the evening, even if there's a wind direction this way, my thermals will be pulled down to that pond first, provided it's not a super strong wind. So in the evening, I can get up there a five mile an hour wind, my thermals will be pulled down to this pond. And even though the wind direction is blowing towards where I think deer are coming from, I'm still going to have an opportunity at them. On the flip side of that though, another way thermals can burn you is we'll say, I'm expecting the deer to come over here. Draw a little deer here. I'm expecting the deer to come over here and drink from the pond. Well, the wind is pulling my thermals down to this pond and it's just going to float and hang out. And because of that, when that deer comes down to the water, I've basically created a bull of my scent and I'm going to have no shot. So this is something you really need to be cognizant of is where your thermals are pulling to and then how they're going to react when they get there. Uh, lower hanging areas, creeks, um, ponds. Creeks are a little different, I'll explain that in a second, but ponds especially tend to act almost like a bull and just catch it and it kind of swirls there and hangs out there. And then your SOL if anything comes down to the pond. Let me, let me draw up a creek real quick. So where a creek is going to differ, and this is something very cool I've noticed, is a creek has a direction of flow. So your direction of flow determines which direction your scent is going. So I've had situations where I'm expecting deer over here. I set up in a tree here and the wind is blowing across the creek, but because of the way thermals work and it being a light wind, it is actually pulling my thermals down into the creek. And then the flow of the creek is pulling my thermals down the creek. So it never actually gets over to my deer here. And I've had opportunities and missed opportunities because I'm not paying attention to the backside of the creek, trying to shoot these animals or shooting at these animals because of that, that helpfulness and that, that uh, thermal flow. So thermals can be your best friend. They can be your worst enemy. The biggest thing is understanding how they work. And a lot of this is going to be testing in your area because it's a little different everywhere else. For <laughs> hill country, uh, that's more, we'll call that lowland river bottom. Hill country still kind of trips me up. And the reason hill country trips me up is you'll have big old hills and then about a three quarters of the way down the hill, and you'll notice if you pay attention where the deer trails are on these hills, but about three quarters of the way down the hill, you'll have what's called a thermal hub. And what that basically is, is it's the thermals from the top and the thermals from the bottom meeting and swirling. Makes it very hard to hunt areas like that because if you're down in the bottom, your scent is being pulled up. And if you're up on the top, your scent is being pulled down. I have yet to be truly successful hunting bucks in hill country, hunting deer in hill country, really. I've killed a few does here and there, uh, but overall I have much less success because I'm still learning the way this works and how to beat it. There are ways to do it. Dan Enfault from Hunting Beast covers this really well in all his hill country videos and explains it much better than I could. Uh, but the only way that I know how to beat it and the one way I've been successful is by getting extremely high up in a tree. There is a point where if you get high enough, you can blow your thermals out over top of where your deer are gonna be. And I'm talking 30 feet, you know, high, high, much higher than I would normally hunt. I normally hunt between 15 and 20, sometimes down to six. Uh, I'm talking 10 foot higher than that. In order to get those thermals pushed out over top of the deer and up at that direction, 
your wind current is more true, which is what we're getting ready to jump into. So that's thermals in a nutshell, but now I wanna cover wind currents. And what I mean by wind current is if you have a field, and we'll just draw a horseshoe field, we'll say this is corn. It's a cut corn field, it doesn't really matter what it is. But if you have a field and your wind direction is like this, blowing into the field, there's a very high likelihood, we'll say this is timber, your wind is going to hit and then it's going to act like a bowl, spoon, whatever you wanna call it. And it's going to blow your wind up in here. So that can be troublesome. If you try to set up, I'm gonna to switch to green because there's a whole lot of brown and make it a little easier on you. If you try to set up here and you're expecting the deer to come out here, there's a chance, good chance, your wind, the wind currents are going to blow your scent down to where these deer are. And I've seen this a ton. They'll come out, they'll feed around, they'll get your wind. They don't blow, they don't act weird. All they do is they go the opposite direction. You never get a chance. And I've seen them a lot of times, they'll go the opposite direction, they'll feed over here and then they go off this way. You never get a chance. So you have to be, another thing when hunting field edges, and this this is true for not only crops, but I've seen it in CRP fields. I've seen, I've seen it in uh, clear cuts. I mean, anything that basically creates a hard line where there's timber, or I've seen it happen in a cut, in a cornfield where there was still some standing crops. We'll say the edges have standing crops still. I've seen it hit those standing crops and do the same thing. So basically anytime you find a hard edge where the wind is blowing into it, you can have that, I call it spoon effect or bull effect or however you want to call it. And what gets really interesting is the shape of the field can often determine how this works. For example, I have a few places that I used to really like to hunt on the public that the fields are basically closed off where this is a field and this is a field and there's a pinch here with timber all around it. And deer love areas like this because they're secluded. You know, there, there's no, usually there's no access to it from the road. It's blocked off, they're by themselves. Uh, and I used to think that was the biggest reason they loved areas like that. And then I realized something else after trying to hunt areas like that. This acts like a giant bull for the wind. No matter what direction this wind blows, it'll blow in here and it'll circle and it'll do all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, I've had winds blowing this way and I get set up back here and the wind is blowing this way. I, I, it's just the way these little, I call them bulls again, work, your scent blows all over the place. And that's why deer, that's another reason deer like areas like that. There's a whole lot of safety involved and in being able to smell anything in this field, no matter where they come from. These fields are nearly impossible to hunt. The one way you can get away with it is if there's legitimately no wind or such little wind you can play on thermals. I can give you a quick example of that. Similar field, I set up back here on this corner and there's a drainage that runs right here. My thermals drop down in this drainage, the deer come from here. That's the only time I've had something like that work is when my thermals are pulling my scent away and I have to make sure this drainage doesn't wrap around where they're coming from. So this takes a lot of boots on ground scouting to understand what this terrain looks like and I do that outside of season. I've even done that in season. I've blown out spots just to understand what they look like and it's worth it because now I know for future reference. The other thing or another field shape that I'm familiar with and the way I've had and seen interactions is this. And again, we'll say your wind is blowing that direction. Your wind will blow in, it'll scoop up and it'll shoot out. Now, instead of it going in here, it shoots out down here. Your wind will also blow here and scoop up and shoot around and down. So if you set up here, your wind is shooting out in this field. Not good if your deer are coming from here, but if your deer are coming from this direction or this direction or from behind you, 
this is a very good spot to set up. The problem is it's going to take some trial and error because it seems like you have a very small window of room that allows you to actually dump your scent out into the field like this. Too much this way and you're wrapping it around this way. Too much this way and you're still okay because you're dumping it out here, but then you could run other potential risks. So you'll have a little bit more freedom on, you'll have more freedom on this side than you will this side. Uh, this is an opportunity that I've seen work a lot. I've done it, I've had friends do it. I've had a lot of good success in opportunities like this. So it's just something to keep an eye out for. Now let's talk about the combination of wind currents and thermals and how to use them to your advantage because that's ultimately what we want to know, right? We want to know how we can use them to hunt. Uh, I have a particular spot in mind Two years ago, I killed my third deer of the season here. And it's a field that's shaped much like what I just drew. It goes like this, and then it shoots up and around and kind of skinnies down again and then goes out like this. Now, from prior experience, I've learned this. This is the low point of the field. This is where all the thermals drop out of the field. No matter the wind direction, everything always settles in this corner. So I tried hunting it from here and I got busted because the deer are also coming from where those thermals are, set, are settling. They bed up in this area. Tried here, dumped my thermals in there, got busted. Tried this side, dumped my thermals in there and got busted. Tried the point here. This is one of those points that is small enough that I don't really have any way to dump, any way to hunt it without dumping back in here because there are no trees here to hunt. Everything is on this side and that dumps my scent right back down in there. In order to finally hunt this, I had to pick a tree out here. And the reason I could get away with that is the wind was actually blowing from this direction. But it blows in, it circles, and it pumps back out. It does that spoon effect I was talking about. Let me just use green here. It does that spoon effect I was talking about. So my scent here was, turn, was coming in it was spinning and it was dumping out. Just so happened, the, the next thing I guess I need to cover before I get into that is when there was no wind, because I thought maybe I'll hunt this in a no wind scenario, when there was no wind, if you got too far down here, your thermals got sucked in. So that's why I hunted back here versus further down is if I got too far, my thermals got sucked in that corner anyways. So I happened to pick a no wind day I got back here where my thermals weren't being dumped down in there. My thermals were pushing this way. And I had a deer come out and I'd watched him do this many times before when I was sitting down here on the point observing or out here in the field observing. They come out, they walk dead middle of this field and they were coming out to feed and then wrapping around this corner. No wind day, knew my thermals were dropping in the wrong direction for them. They come out, I shot a deer here at 37 yards. Now, that was learned through trial and error. And if you were to look at the topography, it doesn't look like the thermal should drop off here. It, this does not look that much lower than the rest of the field. But that, that two degree elevation difference makes all the difference in the world. Not only that, when you get off the backside of this hill right here, then it drops down into a valley. And that's probably a six foot drop down in the valley. I had to drag the deer out of there. That's how I know. So, <laughs> As much as it is very much a puzzle, it doesn't have to be a hard puzzle. It can be something that's figured out and understood. And although I'm not an expert, I've learned through trial and error the way a lot of uh, landmarks function with thermals and with wind currents. And my recommendation is take this video and then go out, go out before season and just take a wind checker with you or take you know, whatever you use and go out and just drop it and watch the way it flows down field edges. Uh, go up to your hill country and get down to that three quarter line that I was talking, three quarters from the bottom and drop it and watch it rotate and watch the way it blows. During the off season, you can even go find the buck beds that you know they were using if you're a buck hunter and stand in that bed and drop your, your wind checker or whatever you're using and watch the way it flows and the way it works. You'll find more often than not those bucks are bedded there for a reason. And I have legitimately found bucks that I, I just don't think are killable. 
they get up 10 minutes before shooting light and they don't go 50 yards from their bed and they bed back down for the rest of the day and then they get up you know five minutes before the end of shooting light and they move 50 yards from that bed and they don't go anywhere else until it's dark and that whole entire time they're bedded in a thermal hub where i can't get to i've seen it a bunch especially in hill country less so on farm and and river bottom seems like those you can find a way in on but on hill country for sure they can be tough okay so i've talked a lot and i've drawn a lot and i'm pretty good at talking and not very good at drawing so if there's anything i missed drop it in the comments i'll try to cover it the best i can if i can't find an answer or give you an answer i can point you in the direction of somebody who can that's it peace